Guys, let's talk about brain care today. Um, so I'm gonna blank out the screen here really quick uh, because I'm gonna ask a couple of rhetorical questions. I want you to focus uh, inward for a little bit. I'm gonna ask you a deep question to start off with. I want you to think back to the first time you really got a job. Where did you learn how to do full-time work? Like the skills to hold down a job, the work ethic required for it. Where did you actually learn about how to work? What was the first one or two, or excuse me, what kind of work ethic did your coworkers exemplify or require of you at that place where you first learned how to work? And then finally, carrying it forward, what philosophies or work habits do you have now that carried over from that place? Many of us learned full-time work from places that are actually not well suited for long-term full-time work. Let me think. Let me give you a few examples here. Uh, if you think about retail and food services, these aren't really great places to learn about how to do full-time work for a long time because you're constantly being told to work harder, and you you have this feeling that you're replaceable, you know. And so there's there's just this pressure on you that's not really healthy for, for long-term full-time work. Sometimes um, we end up having the unlucky bit and work at toxic workplaces where you aren't recognized or let alone enabled over the long-term. A lot of us like me learned full-time work from school, either working on on-campus jobs or as a student because that's actually work too. Um, school, uh, the school administration celebrates getting closer, getting uh, of you getting closer to getting quote fired upon graduation, right? There's not this incentive to work in a way that's conducive to working for years on end at school. That's not what it's tailored towards. Successful companies are not like these examples, okay? Successful companies care a ton about their employees. They consider them to be their friends and their respected colleagues. Great companies invest in the employee's work environment and make it designed for you to stay for decades. So I plead with you as full-time workers, as developers and, and other related uh, uh, job roles in, in a development setting, don't burn yourself out in a few months. Don't work so hard that it becomes unbearable in just a few months. We want you to succeed over the long term. Regardless of where you learned how to work, my goal in this talk today is to convince you to focus on your long-term contributions, your long-term enjoyment and well-being by making certain changes to your work habits. So in developer land, uh, which is a, a big bias of, of myself, that's where, what I know how to work in, we, our work is considered knowledge work. But in order to really define that, I would like to actually explore for a second an example of something that is not considered knowledge work. So let's talk about making cheeseburgers. Uh, let's assume that you are a line worker, a shift worker at a large cheeseburger making establishment, and you are pumping out cheeseburgers to customers. I wanna ask you this question. What percentage of your shift time should you spend on any one of these five activities? Evaluating how to make a better cheeseburger or trying out different assembly line configurations to speed up your delivery time. Sourcing better ingredients. Reimagining the user experience and dining area layout. And cleaning up your messes. What percentage of your time should you be spending on those kinds of activities? I can tell you the answer is as close to 0% as possible. And why? Well, you've got this huge line of customers waiting for their cheeseburger. And the more that you participate as a line worker in those other activities, the less that you are giving cheeseburgers to the people waiting in line. And you're going to lose your customers that way, right? Because you want fast service and you want it right now. So this is a good example of what knowledge work is not, right? You're not paid to think and solve complex problems, you are paid to make cheeseburgers and make them as quickly, but as high quality as possible. 
Let's flip back over to knowledge work now. So in, in knowledge work, your clients usually pay you to do one or two things really well. Uh, I'm a developer at Clearwater Analytics. We are paid, for example, to deliver financial information in a quick, easy, and flexible way. And we have a website to help facilitate that. As a development department, your main contribution to provide value to clients and to the company is writing working code, well-designed working code, and putting it into production. Any other activity that you do doesn't actually help the client, right? That's your, our code is our proverbial cheeseburger, if you will. So I asked the same question. What is the optimal percentage of time that you should be spending typing code on your computer and placing it in a production environment? The interesting thing about knowledge work is the answer is not as close to 100% as possible. That's actually not the optimal number. Now, the exact number varies quite a bit depending on who you talk to, the company you're working for, various other factors and debates that are live today. I'm going to throw out a ballpark number just for setting a, a conversation for us here. And I'm going to say you should be aiming to spend as a software developer 75% of your time actually writing code and putting it out into production. The other 25% of your day, that's a whole two out of eight hours, two hours should be spent brainstorming, coordinating efforts with others, troubleshooting issues, investigating new methods, figuring out how to avoid doing some of the subtasks that are on your plate, reading, training, as well as building a team culture. All of these don't actually provide direct value to clients, but they are needed uh, to serve and support your ability to produce valuable output during the remaining portion of your day. Again, the exact balance depends on various factors and work with your direct manager to figure out what's the right balance for you in your specific job. But we're gonna run with 75% in this talk. In development and, and in knowledge work in general, we are working in a place that requires a high degree of mental exertion. You are largely paid for your brain time, not for your body being present time. As a result, it is essential to participate in activities that promote the healthy function of your brain. Otherwise, you can't generate great ideas when they're needed and re relax the reactive parts of your brain that like to take over. So the best way to get an edge on using your body effectively is to know the anatomy and the physiology behind it. So let's talk about the brain. And then after we visit the brain, we're gonna move into some practical applications of how to get the most out of your brain power uh, during your work hours. So knowledge workers are paid primarily for the function of their prefrontal cortex. That's the area of the brain directly behind your forehead here. Its responsibilities are, but are not limited to, choosing what to focus on versus ignore, your complex planning, your short-term memory live up here, your problem solving, judgment, or evaluating choices against your internal long-term goals. All of those are controlled by neurons centered right here behind your forehead. You should recognize that you need these, all of these in your job as uh, working in a knowledge working kind of environment. It's said that the prefrontal cortex evolved later than your more primal instincts like survival, fight or flight, your reward and pleasure center. All of those areas of the brain are more deeply rooted in yourself than your prefrontal cortex. As a result, this is the thing you might not know. Whoops, sorry. Uh, your prefrontal cortex will disengage if your more internal vital needs are not met. Plenty of studies show that if you are subject to stress, dehydration, bad diet, uh, decreased sleep, it all diminishes your ability to focus, to recall, to plan, to predict, 
and to evaluate options effectively. Which leads me to the first lesson in how to make sure that when you show up to work, you show up with a brain that is ready to work. And that is to take care of your core body needs. Eat well, drink lots of water, a lot more than you probably have been, and get at least six to seven hours of sleep every night and bonus points for beating the sun awake, which is really easy to do this time of year because it's a little bit darker. Um, but beat that sun awake, get that sleep you need. Now, your brain is a muscle. And much like a muscle, if your core needs aren't being met and your prefrontal cortex disengages, you aren't using it. And what happens when you don't use a muscle, especially over an extended period of time? It atrophies, right? So if you don't eat well, if you don't get the water you need or you don't get good sleep, your brain will be weaker. Now, let's say for instance that you have a bad day, you don't really take care of your body and you don't get a ton of sleep and it's not great that next day. You realize the error of your ways and you decide, you know what, I'm gonna eat better, I'm gonna drink water, I'm gonna sleep well. Well, your brain has actually slightly atrophied in that day. And so despite you having a good day, you kind of net zero. So that leads me to my next lesson. To get the most out of your brain, it's good to string multiple days together of eating well, of drinking lots of water and getting good sleep. As you do that, it'll compound and it'll actually strengthen your brain's ability to function. Now, there are other behaviors uh, that affect either weaken or strengthen your prefrontal cortex directly. One of them has to do with sitting all day. It's not actually very healthy for your brain. And I'm really glad I'm getting the chance to say this now because a lot of us are sitting a lot more than what we used to before we entered the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, now, I wouldn't say that the answer to this is to get everybody a standing desk, though that's kind of nice. The thing to focus on is focusing on moving throughout the day. Exercise is linked to better cognition, better memory, and decreased depression. Every source that I looked at in researching for this talk talked about exercise being a crucial part of any morning routine. Now, when I say exercise, I know a lot of you are thinking five mile run or going to the gym three days a week. That's true. Those forms of ex exercise get you the benefits that you're looking for. But even more mild forms of exercise get you the same benefits that you need like doing a quick walk up and down your street, bam, done. Um, a quick little bike ride, doing some morning stretching or focused yoga and deep breathing. All of these more mild forms of exercise are great ways to start your morning and prime your brain to be more healthy and more nimble and ready to focus on the hard problems of your day. Speaking of your morning routine, I wanna double click into that a little bit. Um, an interesting thing I learned, the first, the oh, excuse me, what you feel, think, and plan for in the first half hour of your day will inevitably mirror what you feel, think, and do for the rest of the day. Isn't that interesting, right? The more that you prime your mind to move in a certain way in the morning, the more, the easier it is for it to move in that way later throughout the day. So commit to spend the first 15 to 30 minutes of your day self-reflecting and planning for the day. Don't look at your phone. Don't be distracted by emails and notifications. Instead, think about what you have planned for the day, what you need to get done, who do you need to connect with or lead, and how best, um, how your best self will get through the expected challenges of the day. It's a great practice. Um, I can't really say too much more with the time that I have on morning routines, but I encourage you to actually research this. There's a ton of articles and books about these morning routines. Compare them with your friends. Ask them what's working well for them in their morning routines, uh, and then start putting it into practice. And I think that you'll see a big effect on your ability to function throughout the day. Okay, um, last uh, physiology lesson of the brain, okay? 
reacting to every source of stimulus that comes your way is a sure way to weaken your prefrontal cortex. Again, this is your ability to choose what to focus on versus to ignore, okay? Distractions come from all sorts of different sources, that email notification that pops up, the text that shows up on your cell phone, right? All of these distractions are not good for your ability to focus and to use your prefrontal cortex well. So a great way to instead strengthen your prefrontal cortex is to practice saying no or to practice ignoring a distraction. If you've been looking at my face and then you glance over at this slide and then you back over at my face, but then you can't, you, you find it hard to not look at this sign, you might consider that it, it would be good for you to practice ignoring a distraction. So if you're sincerely interested in trying a practice, what I wanna teach you is just a simple way to give yourself a chance to learn how to ignore a distraction better. So the way to do it is, say you've been distracted by something, okay, you've got that email that popped up, but you were working on something. What you need to do is stop for a moment and give yourself permission to just back away for 10 to 15 seconds. Take a couple of deep breaths and give your body time to think, right? What are you feeling? What, what were you working on? What is it that you want to do? And how are you going to accomplish it, right? And give yourself that time to flow back into the distraction. Be very intentional about thinking about it. Don't discredit the need to practice this. I know it probably sounds a little silly, but honestly, this is what you are paid to do. You are paid for the effective usage of your prefrontal cortex. And so it behooves you to make it as strong and effective as possible. So congratulations on completing this crash course on your prefrontal cortex. Let's start working towards applying it towards work. Now, I wanna share some facts about our workplace to help motivate doing things about it uh, with doing or strengthening our prefrontal cortex for it. Uh, one study I found, uh, found that 95% of people across a variety of different career fields are interrupted five times an hour to, uh, of, of any kind of magnitude, right? The better you are at ignoring interruptions, the less likely you will be as a knowledge worker to fall out of flow. When you show up to work, there are often lots of potential tasks that you could work on. The better you are at prioritizing and solving both short and long-term problems, the more success you will find as a knowledge worker. <clears throat> Many of us today, especially with the changing world around us, are having to solve new and difficult problems that no one else has ever had to solve before, let alone think about. The better you are at finding inspiration and concepts from different contexts being brought together, the more major breakthroughs and impo seemingly impossible answers you will find as a knowledge worker. These are all things about the prefrontal cortex. Okay? Now, the basic strategies are important, but they mostly you mostly you get most of the benefit from those by practicing them outside of work, right? Eat your more good morning breakfast, get the sleep you need, etc. Um, so what kind of tactics can you use during work time to promote the healthy function of your brain? We're going to start by looking at this contrived schedule that I've put together. Uh, in my mind, this is subjectively speaking, but I think this is a very brutal schedule for a variety of different reasons that I'm going to point out here. Uh, in the blue, you have representations of some meetings that I need to attend, and then the whole entire afternoon is unscheduled work time uh, for me to do whatever tasks I want to. Now, uh, I'm going to make an assumption, okay, uh, that each of these meetings is a good meeting that needs to happen for proper coordination and success of the company, and all of the right people are invited to them, right? Big assumption, I know, uh, but we're gonna assume that the meetings themselves are not the problem, right? The problem I see with the back-to-back -back meetings in the morning is that there's no white space in between them. 
white space is this important concept from web design and and design in general. Sorry, I'll I'll, I'll make it bigger. Uh, that makes it much easier to understand things and to quickly find the information that you need. Right? It turns out web design is a really important, or excuse me, web design. <laughs> white space is a really important concept for your day-to-day -day workflow as well. Think about it. If you have that meeting at eight o'clock and it goes right up to the hour to nine o'clock, what's gonna happen? You're gonna say, great meeting guys, really looking forward to those results that we talked about and we'll see you next week when we figure things out. And then you're gonna drop out of that meeting and then you're gonna drop that train of thought because your next meeting is starting right up, right away. And you need to show up quote, ready for that meeting, okay? This is the definition of reactive working. This is like fight or flight mode versus being proactive and constantly engaging your prefrontal cortex. If you had some white space of just two or three more minutes, that train of thought you were on from the tail end of that meeting could have led to some major breakthrough or some important question that wasn't thought of during that meeting. And also, it gives you time to gain closure from that activity and prime your mind for what you're going to say and the energy you're going to bring into the next meeting that you're scheduled for. So I have an invitation to start resisting against the culture of planning 30-minute meetings and 60-minute meetings. And instead, plan 25-minute meetings and 55-minute meetings. Now. These five minutes are not intended to leave room for Q&A at the end of the meeting, right? This is time to allow all of your peers and you to walk away, a few minutes to breathe, especially if it was a stressful meeting, focus on what just occurred, ponder its purpose, commit personally to actionable items and gain that closure. If you do this simple practice, you will retain information and goals better. You will discover ideas and questions that you didn't after the fact. It cleanses your mental palate. It's, it's kind of like oxygen to a fire. It needs that space. And so if you add white space to your day, it will breathe life and productivity into your workday by taking those occasional pauses to reflect, think, and plan. Cool. So now let's talk about that empty space of unscheduled work time at the end. I have two thoughts. One way to train your brain to focus and accomplish your goals while you're at work is by stepping away from your desk specifically to take time to think. If you need to get away to ponder goals, hard problems that you're working on, or fleshing out ideas that are starting to form in your head, do it. Set an away status on your computer and step away for you know up to 30 minutes, right? Get away and think. Some people find this practice so important to them that they actually take time to schedule it directly into their calendar and they call it thinking time. And this is where they contemplate how their day is going, think about challenges they're having, reconnect with things that they planned for in their morning routine, and then jot down new thoughts or ideas in a journal. Um, some people, when they have really hard problems they're working on, they'll get up and they'll walk a lap around the floor of the building that they're on uh, before coming around to give them that time to think. Uh, this is a very healthy way to give your brain that time it needs to focus. Um, so definitely support that practice. The other thing, it's important to have fun at work, right? There's more to being a developer or being a knowledge worker than just plunking away at your keyboard and working on the next task, shipping it out the door, and then moving on to the next task, right? There's a lot more to make, to make work meaningful and enjoyable. So find ways to open channels, to engage with your company's community and culture, encourage participation in it. It keeps your work varied and interesting and allows you opportunities to expand your network. Now, these Moments of breaking away from your actual work should be focused, right? There needs to be intentional about the, each minute that you use during the day. But when you include backing off of actual value producing work tasks, 
it can be a really valuable thing for your long-term benefits, right? We're talking long game here. Okay? Regularly scattered focused leisure and recreation can provide the opportunity for your brain to ebb and flow. This is just like splitting wood. Okay, we all know the best way to split wood with an ax. You're going to pull the ax back and you're gonna swing it down and get a good crack in there, but you're not through yet. And so you take the ax away and you keep swinging again and hacking away until finally the wood splits open, okay? The wrong way to do it is to take your ax, big back swing as big as you can, hard swing, boom, get a good crack, and then keep pressing and pressing and pressing until the ax just falls through the bottom of the wood. It doesn't work that way. So the point here is in order to split the wood, you have to take the sharp edge away from the wood. The thing that's going to open the wood up for you, you're gonna take it away for a brief moment so that it can flow back in and get the momentum that it needs to make a really deep groove uh, in the next stage of the problem you're trying to solve. Your brain works very much the same way. You will not solve a problem better the more hours that you shove into it. Your brain will solve a problem better the more you incorporate an ebb and flow cadence to your work style. Um, yeah. Super important to step away, get the fresh air, walk outside for a little bit, and then come back and you will be a more effective worker. It's super simple, but it's super effective. So schedule in occasional breaks during those long stints of open working time that you have on your calendar. And that'll provide you that backswing that you need so that when you know 3.15, 3.30 rolls around, bam, you can swing back in and your brain is ready on command to solve those hard problems and come up with those great ideas. I have a couple ideas to suggest uh, for what you can do during that free time. All of these are just suggestions of ideas to consider. Work with you, your manager to find the things that together you believe will increase your overall long-term performance and not detract from it, right? That's an important focus. Um, one thing is to switch to an easier task when you need a break. Mindless work can actually provide the ebb you need, but you're actually still doing work that's somewhat valuable, uh, at least to other team members. So I think of doing code reviews or improving documentation or thinking about processes, helping younger or less, or less experienced team members. Uh, with the problems that they're solving. All of these can give you that ebb that you need before you flow back in to the hard problem that you're working on. When it's time for lunch, actually take a break for lunch and walk away from the computer. Go outside and eat your lunch out there. Um, and then drink more water because you always need to be drinking water. Um, read a book or watch an online course to improve your skills as a knowledge worker. A good quote from Stephen Covey, we must never become too busy sawing to take time to sharpen the saw. Right? Take some time to sharpen your saw so that you can be a better saw. So thinking time and taking breaks, great ways to train your prefrontal cortex and give it an opportunity to work in the most effective way possible throughout the day. Um, remember, you're trying to target 75% of your time, roughly, should be spent on actually doing work that provides direct value to your clients. But that other 25% of their time, use it effectively, and it can make a big difference. In the end, I don't really care about how many hours you've put in at work, or whether you can work for long periods of time without taking a break. I care about you performing your best and that your work habits lead you to enjoying your work decades down the road. If you want to create an invigorating and enjoyable place to work where everyone can be the best that they can, taking care of physical, mental, and emotional health is key to be able to do that. So recap. 
Um, take care of your body's core needs by consistently drinking plenty of water, cooking and eating well and sleeping six to seven hours every night. Incorporate some form of exercise in your morning routine and move away from your desk throughout the day. Be proactive and practice saying no or practice ignoring a distraction. End your meetings just a little bit early to give yourself and your peers white space to reflect, think, and plan in between activities. Take time each day to walk away and think. That's That practice, number five there, can help turn all of these other activities into healthy habits because you can think, oh man, I was actually kind of distracted this morning. Maybe I should practice a distraction. Or, or man, my water bottle is still full. Why wasn't I drinking water? Okay, I need to start thinking about drinking water more, right? I thinking time is really important. Build variety and fun into your day by giving your brain chances to ebb and flow during mentally intense blocks of time. Okay. Um, if you're interested in taking a deeper dive into all these topics, these are all great resources that I have perused um, and, and pulled notes from for this particular talk here. We've got different books. There's some great podcasts on the subject. I've found plenty of online courses about focusing and uh, getting peak performance out of your brain. And then there's also some interesting research and, and work in academia that's associated with kind of this kind of topic as well. At the end, I hope that you'll take your well being seriously. You are expected to work 40 hours a week. I hope that these strategies help you deliver on that expectation for the next 40 years. Take the time to take care of your brain, and I promise you that your brain will take care of the rest. And that is the end. Thanks, Jeff, that was great. Uh, do we have any questions? We've got about seven minutes. If no one else has one, I've got one. Um, if you have, uh, you know, we're, we are in the age of COVID, mm -hmm. so uh, we want to get out and exercise. And certainly we all probably have our home, you know, maybe have a home treadmill or something to do a little bit. Um, maybe. So what, what are some things that you or uh, other people you think are doing to, to try to get up and move around? I, like I could, I used to do laps around the, you know, the building, but doing a lap right. around the house is a lot smaller, right? <laughs> Right, exactly. And that's going to get harder with, with it getting colder, at, at least where we're centered at in Boise, it, it, it gets colder in the winter. Um, I, I think just being intentional about your breaks, right? Like I said, just mild forms of movement are enough to stave away the negative effects of just sitting all day. So when it's time to take that lunch break, don't bring your lunch to your desk, right? Like actually go walk over to the kitchen and go sit down at the table for a little bit, right? That little bit is is helpful. Um, I think being intentional just about basic forms of exercise too, you know, do your jumping jacks, do your push-ups, do uh, take, if you don't have weights at home, like get creative. That can be part of the fun too, is thinking, oh, I could use milk jugs today. Oh, I could use this backpack and fill it with all my textbooks because I'm thinking about the things I'm learning, you know, or something like that. Um, so even though you can't really get outside per se, I think that there's still room in the home to be able to get the movement that you need. Thanks. Got a couple of the questions. Here's one. Do you have any advice for people that have difficulty prioritizing waking up with time to do anything before diving into meetings, etc.? cetera? I see. So the folks who are sleeping in. Um, yeah, let's see here. Honestly, I think, I, I don't think I have an easy answer for you. I, I think that you have to change your behaviors to wake up just that little bit earlier to give yourself that time. Like, yeah, you could compensate and do your morning routine as an evening routine. Uh, maybe it's more retrospective instead of forward looking. But honestly, most, if not all of the people that I consider to be really successful folks 
oftentimes they're doing something in the morning. Um, so I, I think being intentional about that really is going to be the thing to try. Great. One more. This is another relevant one to COVID. Do you have any suggestions for managing distractions from others in the home with a large shift to working from home? Sometimes it's hard to say, don't come into the room or office while I'm working, but it's still a distraction when it happens. Yeah, Gal, it is so hard, right? I, I totally get what you're saying. Um, I mean, obviously have the frank conversation before the problem happens, right? That's definitely a first step. Um, but I understand that that's not going to be 100% preventative of at-home distractions that are happening. Um, as much as possible, try to make a dedicated space where it's known that when I am in here, uh, this is my work. Uh, you can use different things to indicate like I am deep in something. Try hard not to distract me. Like some kind of, I, I think of like those uh, Brazilian steakhouses where they have the little red or green uh, little stick that you can use. And if you have it up green, they'll start bringing you more meat. So you could give your family um, some needed uh, relaxing of constraints. So give them some times where you, you turn your little indicator green saying, I'm working, but it's okay to distract me. That way it doesn't feel like such a burden to have it on red eight hours of the day, right? And to really try hard not to distract you for that long, right? Give them opportunities to edge in if they really need to, so that it feels much more bearable for them to back off and try not to distract. Um, but then finally, the last thing is good boundaries of being at work and being at home, right? Try as best as you can to not blend those two together. When you are at work, you are focused at work and really try to prime your mind to think that way. Um, perhaps make your, uh, some kind of commute for yourself in the morning uh, where maybe you do that walk around the block or maybe you, I, I don't know, <laughs> uh, but transition yourself to work. And then when it's time to log off, Right? Not necessarily when you're done with your task, but when you're done with the time that you said that you were going to be at work. Give yourself a mental transition time, again, that white space, and then shut down the computer, turn off all the screens, and walk away and leave work at work as best as you can and make that transition. Um, and I think that can help a little bit with some of the distractions as well. It's great, very timely advice. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more question, if anyone has any anything. I'm not rushing away. So yeah, feel free to ask another question. All right, well, I think our questions are answered. Um, great. 1039, so just about that time. Thanks again, Jeff. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, as you exit, uh, you should see a link for a survey. Please fill out the survey. Um, I know that this uh, the, the, the feedback is very, very helpful in uh, both to the presenter as well as to the committee in figuring out how we can improve our, our, our processes in conference for next time. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mark.